On our first trip of the podcast, Lewis and Chris visit Salt Lake City, where they explore the best way to get from the tarmac to the ski trails. This and more coming up on Transit Tangents. Hey everybody, welcome back to Transit Tangents. My name's Lewis. I'm Chris. And uh, on this episode, we get to share our first trip that we had on the podcast. Uh, We got to go out to Salt Lake City. Uh, We filmed a couple of episodes there, so stay tuned for those. Uh, On this one, though, uh, a particularly fun challenge. Uh, It's been a while since uh, I have gone skiing. Uh, I used to, I grew up in the Northeast, skied all the time. Uh, Chris and his husband Brent go quite a bit, and yeah. the, the pleasure of joining on this trip. So. Yeah, we go skiing quite a bit. It's the first time that we've been to Utah for skiing, mm-hmm. um, which selfishly might be one of the reasons that we chose Salt Lake as our first <laughs> as our first trip of the podcast, mm-hmm. first of many trips coming up. Yeah, uh, for the podcast. And Salt Lake's kind of unique as far as uh, you know. You're probably wondering like, why are we talking about the skiing? But transportation to recreation areas across the country really is becoming an issue as more and more people start to do outdoor activities. Uh, You see this in national parks, uh, other similar instances like that. But in Utah, uh, with the ski resorts, uh, they're having real traffic issues trying to get, you know, so many people who are getting into skiing uh, up to the mountains. And many of these mountain roads are really narrow. They're one way in, one way out. Uh, There's lots of different transit solutions being talked about. There are buses presently. There's uh, plans for potentially a gondola, which obviously piqued our interest. Um, so it's a it's an interesting like case study to go and check out, and it was actually like really informative. And I think you might be surprised some of the things that we discovered and and some of our opinions on it all. So we documented some of our journey of traveling from Austin to Salt Lake. We met up at the Austin Bergstrom Airport, mm-hmm. uh, our international hair, airport, airport, the airport, airport, <laughs> our international airport here in town. <laughs> Uh, and then ventured over to Salt Lake. Uh, we sort of broke this journey into two parts. The mm-hmm. first part was once we landed in Salt Lake, we had to get to the hotel. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did land fairly late. Mm-hmm. And then the next part is getting from the hotel to the ski resort. Yeah, so, so let's see how it went. Excuse me, sir. I have a very important ah, question about gondolas and how you feel me. about them. <laughs> <laughs> they scared me. Where are we today, Lewis? We made it to Salt Lake City. Woo! What's our objective now? Uh, we are gonna catch the light rail, and we gotta get on another one after that. And we'll have a little bit of a walk to the hotel. Um, skis and tow. <laughs> I was not ready for the cold. All right, so to set the scene of what we are seeing, uh the train station thankfully is only a couple steps right outside of the terminal so definitely not bad um there's places to sit but i have to say it is brutally brutally cold uh out here um there's little signs telling you when the trains are going to come there's train hosts to help you out and there's a little place to activate your ticket all in all not bad we're we are currently at the airport we're trying to get to i believe historic sandy so we're gonna go to Central Point Station. It's a Central Point Station, right there. Now we're gonna switch to the red. Right. Nope, I lied, switch to the blue, <laughs> to Sandy. Our map graphics are getting really low tech. You have to make an account before you do anything because <laughs> that's totally on, easy to do once you're like on the go. This Fortunately, on the we have some time. Video yep. Where I didn't have an account and I made it late. <clears throat> All right, so figuring out this app, I think we're gonna, what app are we using? Transit app. Transit app. Because Salt Lake City does not seem to have its own app. So Although we... I, th- I think it's a little cool that it uses this. Yeah. See how it goes. All right. So I need a ticket. I think this is right. It's cool that it like tells you sort of the trip as you're planning your ticket or mm-hmm. as you're getting your ticket. The one potential benefit of this transit app that does work for like even in Austin, it has all the bus routes and tra- like stuff on it. Obviously, you can't buy a ticket on it. But if everyone was using it in every city, that would be pretty cool. That would be cool. But yeah. nah, that's never gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, so the fare type so, thing. Oh, all, yeah, of yeah. The, all of these fares, the bottom are the type of fares you have to choose from? Yes, yeah. and we're, we're doing, it is a lot, So honestly. we're not doing ski one way today, we're just gonna do one way to get to our hotel. Correct. Probably the ski one way tomorrow. Yeah. Wow, that's very close up on your face. <laughs> Successful ticket purchase. Successful ticket purchase. Boom. Let's, there we go. 
waiting to activate. Mm -hmm. But we were just commenting on the the chilly weather. There are no no heat heat vents or anything. That would be a. I'm not cold. Do I look cold to you? <laughs> fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> And here comes the train. Yeah. Electric. Pretty quiet. But we are at the end of the line. Yes. So, just for context here, we're currently... Uh... We're, actually, we're actually a uh, team of three today. And uh, my husband decided he didn't want to take public transit. So uh, we're gonna see if we beat him there. <clears throat> Probably won't, but we're gonna live track his location the whole time. And he's still at the airport and oh, we oh, are- he's moving. Oh, okay. oh, now he's moving. Now is he in the car or is he uh, in, a sh in a shuttle? I don't he's know. probably in a shuttle. Interesting. So it turned out that Brent actually was already in his rental car and not in a shuttle. We had a little bit of a head start. We were on the tracks green line headed into downtown Salt Lake, uh, well on our way, but he was likely going to gain on us. Should you be sitting on public transit according to uh, Hoffman? No. <laughs> Our transfer ended up being very quick. We got off of the Green Line train and switched over to our connection to take us down to Sandy. Uh, it was literally a minute, maybe two minutes in between. Like one minute. Super fast. Perfect. The audio in the train wasn't great, so I'm gonna narrate a little bit of what we were talking to. This train was a little bit noisier. Uh, Brent, while we were on this train, we saw actually had already made it to the hotel. While we were on the train though, uh, he told us that he was actually gonna come and pick us up at the train station. It would have been an okay walk. It was about 20 minutes or so, uh, but with all of our ski equipment and everything, uh, we were totally happy to take the ride, uh, given that it was freezing cold out, uh, there was fresh snow on the ground. Uh, and we had just been traveling all afternoon. So uh, we took the L there, um, but back in uh, where you can hear us a little bit better now. Yeah, we could have taken a more direct route, but yeah, um, it was probably my fault. It wasn't really thinking. Yeah. <laughs> but we're almost there. I'll take the, the L, as the kids say. <laughs> Go for it. We've been, we've been riding this train, and this little whiskey glass has been following us the whole time, and all I can think is like, Where's where's the whiskey? And then I realize, oh, 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 I'm the whiskey, <laughs> which makes sense. <laughs> Made it. Bundled, bundled up now. You yeah. like you live in the north again? Yes. <laughs> Scooters. Oh, we could have scooted. So how was your trip? Uh, it was quick and warm and direct to my destination. How long did it take you to get from the airport to the hotel? Uh, like 25 minutes. And how long did it take us to get from the airport to the hotel? Maybe an hour and 20 minutes, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> About an hour 20. <laughs> Lewis, first impressions yeah. of Salt Lake in the transit? I was impressed that their light rail comes right to the airport. Like yeah. it wasn't a lot of cities you have to like get on a bus and it takes you there, you walk a really long way. The, the light rail actually pulls right up to where someone would pick you up or drop you off from the airport in a car. And I thought that that was really convenient and impressive. They also had like the train host mm -hmm. person there. I liked who, the train host, very, very nice. Yeah, and I mean, he, you know, we, we had kind of figured out what we needed to figure out already, but just having like a friendly face there, being able to help people figure out uh, when the tickets, you know, how to get your tickets, when the train comes, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I was impressed by that for sure. Yeah, um, same. I thought I thought the train being there really close was great. Uh, the service in town, we had to make a quick transfer, mm -hmm. and the trains were less than fifteen minutes apart. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we we stepped out, and we didn't even have time to like get the camera ready again for the next train as it approached. Right. So the the frequency was great mm -hmm. from us being able to go from the airport into town, make the transfer, and then head out to the the hotel. Totally. And there were a couple options, and we're going to get into this more detail in a further episode when we do seeing Salt Lake City in a day using only public transit. So if you're not subscribed, good reason to subscribe to or you know follow or you know whatever platform you're listening on or watching on. 
um, to see that. But we had a couple options. The track system is the light rail system in Salt Lake City, and then they also have a great commuter line called the Front Runner. Um, again, we'll kind of get into more details there. But we actually had options of different ways to go, uh, things like that. But yeah, overall, it was pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, you know, especially for a city the size of Salt Lake, it's not a massive city or anything, and to have the system that they have. Uh, at the frequencies that they were running them at, I was I was pretty impressed. And this was also my first experience with the transit app. Mm. So unlike a lot of cities that may have their own dedicated app uh, for figuring out the lines and buying your fare ticket, kind of like in Cat Metro, we have it, its own app. Uh, there's a, an app called Transit that interfaces with many different transit agencies. Mm -hmm. It was very straightforward on how to get signed up, log, uh, signed up, logged in, put in your credit card information. Mm -hmm. uh, buying the ticket was again pretty straightforward. Right. Uh, and then following the the trains on the maps. So it seems like Salt Lake City has opted to allow this third party to sort mm -hmm. of manage that that mobile and public facing app and it worked out great. And I wish yep. more cities used it. Yeah, I, I think honestly in the future we could do an entire episode on the transit app and how other other folks could could yeah. take advantage of it versus building your own apps. There's definitely pros and cons with that, but um, yeah, I, I did think that that was like, I was surprised when, when we saw it. Yeah, um, super easy, pretty seamless getting out of the airport to the hotel. Yeah. Uh, the next step, though, uh, of this, and, and we skied for a couple of days, and we we wanted to see what it was like doing this in multiple different fashions, basically. Yeah. So uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Salt Lake City, the ski resorts there, and other recreational opportunities there, um, basically just to the west of downtown, you have uh, Little Cottonwood Canyon, which has the ski resorts Snowbird and Alta at the mm -hmm. top of the canyon. And then you have Big Cottonwood Canyon, which has uh, Solitude and Brighton at the top of the canyon. Uh, these are both like one way in, one way out canyon roads that are narrow. Uh, they, in the wintertime, close for avalanche mitigation little, every time there's a big storm. Little Cottonwood Canyon has one of the highest, and I, I can't remember the term for it. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, it's, there's an avalanche index, and it has one of the highest risk potentials for uh, avalanche activity, uh, especially without any mitigation. Right. And as we saw over the weekend, there was a lot of snow all mm -hmm. weekend, and they were constantly working on avalanche mitigation right. and shutting down the road. We experienced some of these closures firsthand. Uh, we talked to a lot of locals. They definitely happen often. Mm -hmm. um, and what ends up happening is kind of a traffic nightmare. Yeah. Um, you know, with people we were talking to and in our own personal experience, I mean, to, to go a span of just a couple miles up these roads takes over an hour every time. Yeah. Um, I mean, we'll get into some of the details. One, one of the ways we came home one of the days just to drive down this road took us three hours yeah. to Very get from the ski time. resort back to our hotel. And it's not just tourists who are, or sorry, it's not just locals who are making this drive. You know, I think mm -hmm. of a ski town and I think locals are driving in and out, mm -hmm. but those who are visiting the ski town are staying at the resort or staying right. near the slopes. That's not really an option. The way these resorts are set up, mm -hmm. in these two canyons at least, uh, is that there's very small villages. There might be one hotel. Yeah. It only it has very limited capacity. And super high prices. For and, and very yeah. high prices. Mm -hmm. So for the average person, you are going to stay in Salt Lake City and you're going to drive to the resort. Mm -hmm. Uh, and locals are, are doing the exact same right. thing. Not to mention so. workers too who are needing to deal yeah. with these. I mean, I can't imagine working at any of these places, but that's a, like just to deal with the traffic. That's a whole whole other story. But um, so everyone is forced to use these these two canyon roads, mm -hmm. which, uh, as we said, get closed down pretty frequently. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, it was interesting. One of the days in particular, though, uh, we had like a really it, it got more interesting on accident actually as, as we started <laughs> doing it. Um, Little Cottonwood Canyon was, was closed down for most of the day this day. So we decided to go up to Big Cottonwood Canyon, um, we, with, with the goal of skiing at Brighton Resort. And, uh, Chris and I were destined to take the ski bus. So the ski bus, uh, is, a, it's, it's exactly what it sounds. Basically it's a bus service that goes, uh, from Salt Lake city, hitting a couple of different parking rides, um, and then goes up to the ski resorts, uh, in addition to the traffic issues. Ski resorts also have limited parking because these are in narrow canyons. Um, so we, we should note that these buses are part of UTA, which is the Utah mm -hmm. Transit Authority, Correct. Transportation Agency, yep. Transit Authority. Uh, but they are UTA buses, so they are city buses that mm -hmm. are, uh, for the most part, also making rounds through the city. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple that just circulate the parking rides and back mm -hmm. up to the resort, 
Um, but there, we had some options where you could literally jump on a bus somewhere right. in town and that bus take you straight to the right. resort. And they, yeah, and they basically, they service the ski resorts, they service some trailheads along the way. There's a lot of backcountry skiing, cross country skiing along the way as well. And yeah, we wanted to see what they were like. They um, sound like very viable options. If right. you don't want to drive, you don't want to pay for a parking pass, mm -hmm. uh, or if you're just trying to skip traffic. So we thought. Right. Uh, so we'll talk more about this in a second, but I think we should just kind of share with you all what our experience is here. Um, we're going to play a couple clips. It was difficult to get all of this because, as you're going to find out in a second, it was an ordeal. <laughs> Um, but yeah, just the, the, the very brief overview is that Chris ended up taking the bus. I ended up essentially hitchhiking. A, a group <laughs> stopped and wanted to add another person to their vehicle because the parking situation is cheaper if you have three people in your car and they had one extra spot. So I got on the car with those folks. And I was abandoned. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Chris was abandoned. And, and then Chris's husband, Brent, drove up yeah. into the canyon. Um, let's just go ahead and take a look at some of that footage and we'll talk more about it. So Lewis, what's happening right now? We are going to attempt the ski bus based on the clusterfuck of traffic behind us. I'm curious how long it's going to take for this bus to reach us because there is not a special bus lane or anything like that. So, uh, not optimistic, but you never know. We might make it to the mountain. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris and I were trying to take the bus for the for today and uh, Brent was taking the car again just to see the time difference and we got dropped off at the park and ride while well, we walked a bit to the park and ride because the traffic was bad and Brent was further back in line for the line to just get up Big Cottonwood Canyon and about five minutes after being there a uh, couple pulled up looking for a third person for their car, and uh, I got picked up. <laughs> All right, we'll do it here. Three, two, one. Good luck, Chris. Good luck, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Chris waited for the bus. He waited an extra probably 25 minutes at least, um, and I got up here first. Nice conversation. A lot of snow. So we'll see how long it takes Chris and Brent to get here. <laughs> so let me lay the scene. We left the hotel. Mm -hmm. We knew that Big Cottonwood Canyon had been closed for a little bit of time that morning. We were not expecting the traffic jam that we saw at the entrance of the canyon. Mm -hmm. uh, when we arrived, uh, we sort of mistakenly got out of traffic and drove to the entrance of the canyon, not realizing that the line we were passing that was a mile and a half long, <laughs> were just all vehicles trying to go to the same place we were. So that's when Lewis and I decided, all right, we're gonna sit in traffic anyway, today's the day, let's take public transit. Right. So uh, <laughs> Brent uh, drove into a parking lot near the base of the canyon, he let us out. We had to then go back into the canyon to get to the park and ride, mm -hmm. uh, which is right at the, the entrance, the mouth right. of Big Cottonwood Canyon. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Brent got back in line to, right. to wait for the traffic. And this is a pretty normal scene for how people would use this. So the ski buses don't go everywhere. And frankly, not to be a downer, but to try to go skiing from like anywhere in town with your skis, your boot, like all of your equipment, r doing multiple transfers. I love public transit. <laughs> I do, but like that situation as is with the frequencies that they're at and everything just wasn't going to happen, Carry at least based on where we were staying. We were staying closer to the other canyon also, yeah. so that made it tricky. But the park and rides is kind of what this is, like in a lot of ways it's advertised to be like, go park in these park and rides and take the bus. So I think the experience that we had was one that is what kind of what they're aiming for yeah. is, is, is a park and ride situation here. What we did, we walked through the intersection, we went um, to the park and ride and waited for the bus and there were probably 40 people yeah. uh, at the park and ride waiting mm -hmm. as well. Um, and the situation there was actually a little tense. Like uh, yeah. it, it was clear that when we got there, a bus had not come for a long time. And despite there being a schedule, it was clear that that schedule meant absolutely nothing. Yeah. Like absolutely nothing. It, it's bus is scheduled every half an hour. People had been waiting there clearly for more than that. 
they did have two kind of like hosts who worked for the UTA at there were the three. station. Three. There were three hosts all trying to keep the peace. And I mean, at one point, some of them were saying like, oh, a bus will be here any minute. A bus will be here any minute. And clearly they didn't even have any clue when the buses were coming. And I mean, I'm going to take a leap here. I wasn't at this spot for very long before I was picked up by the lovely couple who drove me up the canyon in a nice comfy car. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but... uh I'm going to take a leap here and say that those people were basically there to like keep the peace a little bit. Yeah, um. absolutely. <laughs> no, they're 100% because you would have uh, groups who were trying to get um, on the bus that were kind of angry that they had been waiting so long. I mean, look, it's cold. Mm -hmm. you have, you're have you covered in ski gear. You're trying to carry heavy stuff around. Mm -hmm. um, it, it wears down on you pretty quick. And then to top it all off, you have the carpool folks who um, are trying to get a, a discount parking at um, Solitude or Brighton. They're coming around the circle and just yelling out of their car, right. hey, I got two to Solitude, I have I have three to Brighton. Mm -hmm. And these groups are scrambling and trying to like ambush these cars to get in. So the UTA folks, while I don't know if it's actually their job to manage the carpool situation, <laughs> they were doing a pretty good job of like trying to ease the tension and right. get people in cars and get them to the resort. Because right. I think maybe they did know the bus is going to be a while. Right, yeah, definitely not an ideal situation. But basically, like as we were going up, or as I was going up, uh, we quickly realized that I was ahead of Brent, yeah. um, which was interesting because uh, he had to kind of loop back around and get in the line, whereas the car that I got into basically had been in line already. Um, and uh, we, you know, I got in the car. It still took me well over an hour, yeah, maybe an hour and a half from the base of the canyon to get up to the resort, which is wild. Um, Brent I think was, you were about halfway up the canyon before I even was picked up by a bus. Which is also insane yeah. um yeah uh, yeah so i got up there you know fairly unscathed in in this you know uh, nice and, warm comfortable back seat good and, company and good park like we were we were like i don't know 20 feet from the lift where we parked yeah. so it was yeah, rub, basically like more. ready to go um <laughs> brent who was driving uh the parking spot he was able to get was literally almost a mile away yeah. I think, uh, yeah, we walked it at the end of the day. And then your situation is by far the worst, so I'll let you yeah. explain what happened. So uh, when when Lewis got picked up, I very graciously allowed him to go instead <laughs> of me in this, this carpool, uh, thinking that the bus was going to be right behind him. Uh, it was about 10 minutes later that Brent entered the canyon, and I got a nice little wave from Brent over text <laughs> message. Uh, and so I, I, I pulled up my Find My Friends, and I watched them uh, proceed <laughs> up the canyon without me. And it was about 45 minutes after that that I sat there and I waited for the bus to arrive. And the very first bus that actually showed up uh, said out of service. <laughs> and they were just going to continue out of the canyon. But the UTA guys told them, like, hey, you got to get these people on the bus. Like, they've mm -hmm. been here a while. There's going to be a mutiny. <laughs> get them on the bus. And so the bus driver let us on. But then we had to leave the canyon. Mm -hmm. So after everyone else had waited in traffic for over an hour to get in the canyon, the bus leaves the canyon. We go to another park and ride that's further about, away. That's about ten <laughs> minutes away. We pick up people in that park and ride. Um, the bus was full to capacity. I was lucky that I had a seat because I was one of the first people. Um, I, was, I was part of the first pickup. But I'm still like I'm squeezed into my seat. I have my skis between my legs. I'm like trying to hold those up. You know, you're wearing big puffy jackets. It is not comfortable. And then the poor people who got on the bus at the second park and ride had to stand in the aisle, which I have to say cannot be the safest no. solution for going up a no. snowy mountain canyon. No. But there were people in full ski gear, boots, everything, holding their gear, and they stood in the aisle for over an hour yeah. for us. Actually, sorry. More than that. It was more than that. It was an hour and a half from that mm -hmm. park and ride. But uh, they, yeah, they stood there in the, in the aisle mm -hmm. with all of their stuff. <laughs> um, all said and done. I mean, I beat you to the top by like two hours. Yeah, two hours. Um, I had already. I mean, I started skiing. I said, I feel. I feel bad. Uh, I'm after I got up there. I was like really relieved that I was not in Chris's situation, but I felt horrible. Uh, <laughs> I did. It was. It was very. I was very conflicted. Um, I think we can laugh about it now. We can probably. laugh about it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also. The yeah, the bus ride up, it was it was so slow. You're stuck in traffic the whole time because uh, one of the reasons I'm so upset that we had to leave the canyon is that we then had to sit in traffic to get back to the, into the to canyon. The the canyon yeah. And then so once we got in the canyon, I think I sat there next to the parking ride in the bus 
for, oh, we went back to the same park and ride. We went back to the park and ride that they picked us up from the first time, mm -hmm. and we picked up like two or three more people. But we, we sat there in traffic just outside of the park and ride for another like 10, 15 minutes, and then just slowly, slowly made our way up to the canyon to the point that I took a nap. I, I took a 20 minute power on nap bus. on the bus. Um, it yeah. was it was pretty miserable. I will say props to everybody who who experienced that journey with me. I asked a couple people if they wanted to talk about the experience. Like I was going to record a conversation and the like three people around me were like, absolutely not. <laughs> so, which is totally fair. I would, I would have said no at that yeah. point, I think also. But props um, to everybody on the bus for having pretty good spirits the mm -hmm. whole time. And uh, we, we did finally make it there. I know when we finally pulled up to the resort and the door opened, this kid just goes bolting out of the door. He's like, get me off this yes. bus. Yeah. It was yeah. very, really, really funny. No, and I mean it's it was a wild scenario, and and there are some some proposed solutions, and we are going to talk to someone in the next episode uh, in depth about one of the solutions for one of the canyons, uh, Little Cottonwood Canyon, which there there is a proposed gondola to to run up this area. Uh, it's very controversial in the area. Um, uh, I don't. I'm not going to talk too much about it because it is. It is. Trust me when I say it's worth watching in the next episode. Yeah. Um, really good conversation with somebody uh, about the gondola. Um, so, so definitely be subscribed for that, but, um, you know, other solutions, I mean, or, or issues with the current system is again, lack of a real schedule because the traffic is so bad. Um, the bus sits in the exact same traffic as everybody else. There is no bus lane. There's no bus priority. The buses not only have to sit in all the traffic, but they also have to wind through the same parking lots yeah. that all the people are taking forever to park their cars in. It's, it's, it's a laughable solution in my opinion that isn't. Like you're never gonna if someone did that once, they're they're never gonna do that again. It, right. What, like as oh, it is right yeah. now, you're never gonna do that again. It, it, until it improves, I don't think I'll ever I don't think I'll ever do it again. No. Yeah. No. And and again, like we're people who want to right. do that sort of thing. Although, to be fair, I don't know that I ever want to sit in that traffic to go skiing again. the conversation that I had with the folks in in the car who drove me up said it was really normal to be sitting in that sort of traffic. They were like, oh, yeah, like we're, we're lucky if we're ever at the mountain in two, you know, two hours, let alone what we had, they had gone through yeah. that day. Um, to me, waiting in line for that long is not a real answer. And, and again, there are a lot of really interesting solutions that we kind of discuss at length uh, in the next episode that, that is, is worth uh, checking out. But Yeah, in this whole conversation, like we understand skiing is um... – in a way, it's a lot, kind of like a privileged sport, right? It costs 100%. A, it costs is, yeah. a lot of money mm -hmm. to to be able to go ski, and we're we're sort of complaining about like sitting in traffic to go do this yeah. this activity. But it's it's sort of beyond just the skiing. You have people who are doing the the backcountry skiing, which is a much more affordable and accessible totally um, way to get out and enjoy nature. <clears throat> people but getting this, to work. <laughs> people people getting to work. People yeah. who are trying to get to the canyon to. Um, be there to to serve food and operate the lifts mm -hmm. and and make this an enjoyable day for for people coming in. Mm -hmm. um, you have families who are trying to teach their kids. You know, you may have kids who are are dedicated mm -hmm. to the sport. All of this has just become so much more challenging. Mm -hmm. But this isn't a problem that's unique to Salt Lake City. This mm -hmm. is a problem that we experience in recreational areas across the country. Absolutely. Um, you look at the national park system and we have to do timed entry for mm -hmm. vehicles because we've just sort of been overwhelmed by mm -hmm. individual cars going into these these natural spaces. Right, yeah, and whether it's timed entry or permits or things like that, I mean, we've seen stuff like this in Zion National Park and Yosemite National Park. Uh, I mean, I've seen the traffic jams getting into Arches National Park. All, there's all sorts of examples and honestly, at some point, uh, transportation and recreation areas, I think would be a, a fun episode to do like more broadly. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good point that like, you know, this is one kind of niche solution, uh, one niche situation, not so it's not a solution mm -hmm. right now, um, situation, but I think it's something that, yeah, you can see in all sorts of different places across the country. And what's tricky and why people are so kind of passionate about these, as we'll find out in the next episode, is that the places that these are happening in are like really sacred places to so many people because they're beautiful landscapes that are basically, I mean, they're, they're, you know, unique to that thing. You can't, once you mess that place up, there's no getting it back necessarily. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, we don't have an answer to, to what the solution is to make the, the traffic better per se, but what we know is that the current situation is not sustainable. Right. And, and the person we're going to talk to yeah. next had some really good ideas and in the midst of the conversation, my mind was actually changed on a couple things. So I they definitely want 
folks to make sure you're subscribed uh, to listen to that conversation. Um, but yeah, with that, uh, anything else you want to add or are we? I think that covers it. Um, yeah. We're going to cover a lot in the next episode, so definitely mm -hmm. stay tuned. Yeah. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, if you're listening on a podcast platform right now and you made it this far, please give us a five-star rating. Uh, that would be amazing. Or if you don't think it's five stars, I guess you could do less. Whatever but, rating um, you feel comfortable with. Right. Unless it's five less stars. than five stars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, uh, please hit the like button. Leave a comment. We definitely want to hear uh, your feedback. You can follow us on any of the socials that will be linked down below. Uh, but without further ado, thank you all so much and we'll see you uh, on Tuesday of next week. Yeah, I'm saving that dough. Public transit's where it's at. Watch me go.